Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, the next episode of The Era, where we spend our time really getting deep on the employee experience that so many um, millions of people across the world are having in their jobs, in their workplace, and how that experience can ultimately be tied all the way to business outcomes. And we are so excited today to have a, a special guest that it's going to be a wonderful dialogue and discussion because many female leaders in business today have paved the way for the next generation of the workforce, creating a new employee experience and culture for everyone. And our guest today, Cheryl, Cheryl Tullis, is a trailblazer for both women in tech and veterans in the workforce. So Cheryl, from West Point to Procter & Gamble, to Microsoft, to now, today at TAG, your experience is incredibly varied. Uh, but there's one constant throughout your career, you pioneer change. So what do you think made you capable of, um, of breaking through some of these barriers that you've, that you've faced? First of all, thanks for having me, Brad. I'm really excited. I do follow Bamboo HR in the era, and so it's a real honor to be here. First and foremost, so, yeah. First and foremost, I don't think I knew what I couldn't do. My parents were both in STEM fields, and I never knew girls were supposed to be bad at math and science or that they couldn't be military leaders. I just didn't have those constraints on me. And I feel like that is key for entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs in companies challenging or ignoring the barriers or the, the reasons things can't change. The people are always going to throw up reasons why not to change, but I think we all saw in 2020 how quickly we can change when we have to. So if leaders can remove those constraints, both real and imagined, we can go forward a lot faster. And so as, as you think, you know, leaders, so it sounds like embracing that change, but so many people talk about like, hey, I'm open to change and I can do that. But then when it happens, um, you know, all that kind of goes out the window. And how, you know, what is the, the quick snippet of advice you give to a leader to, um, you know, to not only empower them to embrace that, but to drive positive change in whatever, you know, environment they're trying to do that? Great question. I know in Israeli schools, they do something different, which is they encourage dissent. They encourage debate and discussion. And is Israelis have come out with some of the most innovative technology and AI in the world because they don't believe in those boundaries. They believe that they can challenge the status quo. So there's that sense of empowering people to challenge what's going on right now and then giving them the rope to do that. I think I've always been really lucky to have managers who do give me that rope and um, have confidence in me and that confidence in, in me from them gives me I think, more of a sense of ownership. Like I'm the one who can make this change. I'm the one that has to do it. Um, I think another area is just not staying comfortable. And I recommend a book called Range, which talks about how generalists succeed in a specialized world. He talks about elite athletes, artists, forecasters, and Nobel laureates. And my career approach is followed that, paralleled that. It's been more of a scavenger hunt than anything, but it's resulted in a diverse set of experiences. And so that helps me kind of connect the dots across roles and gives me a sense of how things can be because I've seen it be different somewhere else. I love, Cheryl, what you're saying on the descent. Um, it is, it, it's almost a learned um, mechanism. And I love how you talked about people have given you permission to do that. And at Bamboo, we have a, one of our values is be open and where we're trying to give um, all of our team the permission to, hey, share what you're feeling, get, you know, um, ask questions, ask, ask um, um, if you, if you um, disagree, make sure that you're being open, but it still is uncomfortable and you almost have to be willing to step into that discomfort like you were talking about. What a, what a wonderful framework to, to think through that. Yeah, my team calls me out on things. And of course, it's natural to be defensive, but it's always a gift when they push back and see how something could be better. So, Cheryl, let's get into um, how did your time in the service, how's that influence? You talked about the scavenger hunt kind of 
you know, um, nature of your career, which is a what a fun way to describe, um, you know, um, consistent discovery. Um, but how does how did the time in your service, how does that influence how has that influenced your civilian career? You know, the leadership training that I got at West Point and after is unparalleled. And Procter & Gamble actively sought out academy grads for our leadership experience. They knew they could train us to be brand managers, but they wanted to bring in that that base training. So that gave me a leg up in getting into Procter & Gamble. And they have a fantastic training and development system there. And that helped me define a blueprint for roles and career ladders for the 7,700 marketers at Microsoft. Microsoft didn't have that kind of systemic training and and role development at the time, but I had seen it somewhere else, so I could apply it. Um, I was also able to create a bench leadership program when I was working for the chief marketing officer. All of the vice presidents in marketing reported into her, and so I could help them with their their bench and their succession planning because of what I learned in the military. And I think the last thing is I myself experienced this career transition from military to the civilian world. It's not easy, but that helped me co-create something for Microsoft called the Software and Systems Academy, which is now a global program for transitioning service members. And so let's, let's maybe, you know, like, if I dig at the some of the qualities, because I want to get it back into leadership development, because this is a huge uh, opportunity across every industry in every um, part of the market. But before we go there, I do want to just get into what you know. Go back to your your time in the service, and now carry that that kind of pull that thread forward for us. What qualities did you learn there that have impacted your civilian career? Because I, it would be fun to do some pattern matching for people who are listening to this. It's like, well, I didn't serve in the service, but like what qualities have helped Cheryl? And then maybe how could I institute that with my my own team? There are a lot of traits I see that I either learned or strengthened in the military. First is just an understanding of clarity, clear communications and clarity of mission. I think leaders communicate the why, the what, the where and the when, but in the military, we leave it to the lowest level to figure out the how. They they participate in the planning and, and they everybody feels invested in the mission because they're part of that. Another one is teamwork, of course, uh, but everybody has an important role, not only in the planning and the execution, and we can't do it without them. So making sure that we trust each other is vital. So I would point them to character. Character really counts integrity and trust are a foundation of good morale on any team. And it, what would you say then on that question? How do they instill those same qualities in a team that has never gone through that, that amazing training that it sounds like you had at, you know, at the Academy and in the service? Well, one is practice. I mean, that's what, okay that's what basic training is about. And that's what you see with SWAT teams, right? It's muscle memory when they go into an uncertain situation. So we have to practice that. A way that I practice our skills and and the traits on my team is we're a creative group. And so we'll get together for a standing 15 minute meeting and we practice creative. We we might take two different products from amazon.com, put those together and sell it to me. And then we practice giving feedback to each other because that's also an important part of the creative process. And when everybody is in the hot seat and is receiving good feedback, I think everybody starts to work better together. And I think that can happen with pretty much any task orientation that a team could have. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I love that. Are there any, are there any shortcuts that, you know, that people could use to get it or is it just practice? Cause I think about, I think about James Clear has the book Atomic Habits, and one of the things he talks in there, he uses the same word you just use, which is if you want to have high trust, is like, well, practice. What are people who have high trust? What do they do? And practice doing that until it becomes part of your identity. And does it just take time to instill these qualities? Is there any, are there any shortcuts to it? Or is it just like, nope, it's got to practice it long enough to where you kind of get to where you need to be as an individual or a team? Are there any shortcuts? 
I don't know if there are ever shortcuts, but maybe there are hacks. <laughs> <laughs> I think it starts with just open and transparent communication and it takes time to build. There's also this element of confidence in each other. And that confidence comes from experience, both at a personal level and a team level, I think. Uh, pushing through adversity together, developing that grit and that learning how to win together is all a huge part of that. Personally, when I went to West Point, I had never participated in organized sports. So physical endurance was a huge challenge for me. I had gotten teamwork from band and from a bunch of music roles, but you know that didn't help me with my push-ups and runs. So there were a lot of times I didn't think I was going to go one more mile or one more push-up or stay awake for one more hour. And there were times that I failed on those, but I had to push past my like, physical and mental limits because that was the only way through. And I learned that I can always do more than I thought I could and I think teams learn that too. When they push through the hard times, that builds teams faster than anything. I I love that. <clears throat> I think that's exactly right. I People ask all the time, it's like, well, how do we get a more engaged team? And I'm like, have them go through something really hard together. Have them, have them do something to where they go through that kind of that fire together and they come out and they are, they're bonded, connected and, and proud. And so you talked about the increase in confidence. That's 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 the only hack that I know of. It's like, if you want a more engaged workforce, because people talk about that from an employee experience standpoint. And 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 I think how you have more engaged employees is certainly you provide an environment for them that they can um, bring all of those, all of uh, their skills and their abilities to bear, but give them, you know, give like, you know, put them in a team to where they're doing hard things. And I think you'll see, um, them respond for the most part. Absolutely. Big believer in that. So TA Group's a veteran-owned business. We've talked about that. Um, and you have been an incre- and continue to be. You've been an, and continue to be an incredible advocate for hiring um, skilled veterans. So for, for those hiring managers out there, those heads of HR, those business owners, um, what are some of those qualities? What's the why behind, hey, Looking at this um, this population as a um, as a as a potential add to your business, what are, you know? What are some of those those qualities and characteristics that you think that can add to any business? This is such a timely question because just this week I published a LinkedIn article called "Bold Leadership in a VUCA World." And VUCA is a concept that originated in the U.S. Army War College in 1987, back while I was a cadet at West Point. It stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And that term is maybe more relevant across the globe today than it even was back then during the Cold War. So what business leaders should know is that so many veterans are just adept at dealing with ambiguity. They are used to going into a new environment, maybe a new country overseas. Um, They can quickly get up to speed, communicate clearly and concisely, uh, figure out how to use the limited resources they have and win. They're also fluent in some of the most advanced technology on the planet. So they're comfortable with discomfort and they're comfortable with the steep learning curve. In TA Group, I've led a staffing business, a tech staffing business, and one mistake I see hiring managers and recruiters make is looking for exact experience with specific technologies or with a specific project rather than looking for aptitude. There's such a shortage of of technical people and engineers right now that they have to shift to looking toward aptitude and who can learn and do the job quickly. And so I think what they should look for is more veterans who haven't maybe had that very specific experience, but who have all of the skills and drive and grit to see a mission through. I, I think, I think, you know, veterans deserve that kind of an opportunity. Um, and I think that hiring philosophy, Cheryl, may not even, you're, you're cracking the code that I think is one of the most important things that can, that can propel lives forward and can propel businesses forward which is 
um, are we looking past the resume? Um, are we looking past the, the, you know, the, the resume and looking to what's the potential? Um, what is that? Cause I think about my career and there were times that someone gave me maybe an opportunity or a role that there's, if you looked at my experience, there was no reason why anyone would believe that I could do it, except someone was willing to look past that and to say, Hey, based on things that, that Brad's done, um, I think he can do this. And I think about the veterans who, you know, need a shot like that. And what an amazing kind of way to frame the opportunity there. Exactly right. And TA Group stated mission is to give more people responsibility earlier than they could get anywhere else. And yeah. it's just for that reason, uh, you know, our role is to hire well, then trust in those young leaders and help them build their systems for success. And they can do more than we think they can do. Yeah. Well, Cheryl, thank you for that. And I, and I hope our listeners kind of take that to heart and to say, how do I, how do I really unlock what is an amazing talent pool for my business that could help, help move us forward? How would one get started? Like, what would you suggest if it's like, okay, Cheryl, I listen to Cheryl, I'm ready to go. Like, how do I tap into this highly skilled um, group? What do I, what's my next step? I'll just point you to a single resource that can help you from there, which is the USO. The USO has a program that originated right here in the Seattle area uh, with Lake, it's, it's with a joint base, Lewis McCord was where the first center was. But they have something called Pathfinders and the Pathfinders are dedicated to helping people transition and helping families transition, not just the veteran. Uh, in education, with work experience, with resume assistance, and they can help you match your job description to veteran skills because there's often a translation that's needed. So definitely check out USO Pathfinders. It's a global organization now founded by RJ Noggle and Ann Sprout, who uh, were been my battle buddies in building this transition stuff. That's awesome. Thank you for help because it's that next step that I think so many times that people need. Well, Cheryl, you're also a strong advocate, I guess, in the, your spare time. You, you, you do many different things here um, for women in STEAM careers. Like it seems like this is your calling to help people unlock their potential and, and, and find a path in a way. And with, you know, these STEAM careers continuing to become more and more important and more in demand. Um, what improvements and opportunities do you see that are, are needed for women that seeking these careers to garner more and, and fair opportunities? The first thing is just access to them. So I feel strongly there should be more certification programs uh, at the community level for all of the STEAM fields, for all of those open roles there, as well as for the, the uh, skilled trades. Uh, so let's make sure that People don't have to be able to afford expensive college careers in order to land these well-paying jobs. Um, the second is we need to have more women and minorities in the boardroom and at every layer of leadership because women have to be able to see themselves at the next level. Minorities have to be able to see themselves at the next level. Uh, so it's really vital that we have representation at each of those layers. There's something every single one of us can do as managers or as mentors and coaches, which is advocacy. There's a book called The Confidence Code that talks about the gap between the percent of women who will apply for a job and the percent of men who will apply for the same role. And the data is that women tend to think they need to have 95% plus of the skills before they'll even consider applying, whereas men will go for it at maybe the 65% level. So there's a definite need for managers to recommend women, minorities, introverts, you name it, and invite them to apply for roles because they might feel like they don't have a chance. But we know as managers that there's probably never the 100% ready person or 100% skill fit person. Uh, but we need to give them confidence that they can grow into those roles. I love the, the confidence gap. What a gift you could give to any human to help them bridge that confidence gap. And whether it's in their career, in their personal life, and whatever that is, that is 
that is a gift worth giving to help people there. Thank you um, for, you know, and, and I look, Cheryl, at you. I mean, you've worked, you, you know, you made the career transition, you know, um, and, you know, and how have helped with this Pathfinder program with veterans getting into the, the workforce. And we're, I've worked at a manager level all the way up to the C-suite as we, um, we were talking about as we were preparing. What do you think, have we made improvements? What do you think we've improved um, with or around with women in tech in recent years? Definitely the last two years have shown the value of flexible work. All the data show that people can be just as productive and maybe more productive with remote or flexible scenarios and their quality of life is better if they can choose when and where they work. So that's number one is we need to keep up the flexible roles. Uh, we also saw an outsized impact on women leaving the workforce during the pandemic uh, and they haven't returned. And partially that is because there's a big burden on caregivers, uh, child care, elder care, parental leave. We need more resources that really elevate the importance of those because that is what society needs is not just what women need. I think finally, one area I've seen I'm concerned about is resilience. I think we need to invest more resources in resilience because we're seeing so much burnout across the board right now. Uh, I see it on my team uh, with them needing to take breaks more frequently. And there's a real need to understand both the physiology and the psychology of it. So I went and got a certification in resilience in 2020 so I could understand it better. I'm building a course right now, uh, co-authoring it so that we can help managers understand that as a key to developing resilient teams so that they can manage down the churn that can better engage and retain their folks um, because employees are living in this VUCA world. So we have to help them be resilient through the VUCA. Yeah, I. this is one I consistently hear across our customer base is, you know, because I go back to the qualities that veterans, you know, we were talking about what makes veterans such great and um, amazing employees and leaders. And I think that the VUCA, the volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity um, and and having the the that, you know, just like you talked about when you were at West Point, that one more push up, that one more mile Sometimes, you know, that's the best way to show resilience is to prove to yourself that you can do that. And are there tools and capabilities that we can we can teach just like we were talking about teaching qualities that veterans have that other employees could take it, you know, could take advantage of and use as tools. Um, resilience is a tool and a quality that I do think is we're in dire need of 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 helping. I don't know that we as a society or our educational system or we're not doing a great job of that today. I'd agree. I think that's my next phase. It's maybe not women or veterans, uh, it's resilient teams. And and that actually said, so we've talked about veterans, we've talked about women in the work, workplace. In technology, in the industry, what do you think um, employees in general need? What are, what are, we talked about resilience. Are there any others that you would add to that around that employee experience that people could grasp onto and maybe learn from? Having distributed teams has always been a challenge. I mean, I had them, you know, Procter and Gamble and at Microsoft because I had global teams. So you were time shifting and, and nobody was ever in the same room together. Uh, but all of my team is remote now. We almost never see each other except online. And, and one thing that's, it's been a great equalizer because you don't have the haves and have nots when everybody is remote. Uh, but we do lose the connections. And so I think it's even more important to maximize FaceTime when it's possible and to because you learn people in a different way there. I had this experience as an intern it, that it also makes me think of how do we have internships that are really meaningful now, especially in the remote environments. The internship I had was unusual, but there are a lot of lessons from it that are applicable. Since I was a cadet at West Point, I interned as a speechwriter for Colin Powell. So imagine writing speeches for a four-star general. It's going to deliver them nationally as a 21-year-old. It was a huge learning curve for me. And I could go on and on about all the lessons I learned from him, but the most standout thing from that whole experience was how Colin Powell made me feel as an intern. 
He made me feel trusted, valued, part of the team. He took me on his jet as he traveled around to give these speeches. He acknowledged me. And that, more than anything, magnified the impact that he had on me as a leader. And that sense of belonging is kind of an army fundamental. Army talks about mission first, people always. But he lived it. And that really inspired me to live that too. And I see that uh, when people are disengaged, I'm not sure they feel like they belong, whether they belong for a skill set fit or a culture fit or whatever else. And it's not their fault. Like, it's on us as leaders to make them feel like they belong. Belonging as a principle is super powerful. What an amazing story with Colin Powell. Like that makes me, you know, just that story. I'm like, okay, I'm getting off the time that I spent with Cheryl. I'm going to go be better. Um, at, you know, at doing some of those things. What a, what an amazing story. And Cheryl, I just can't tell you, I mean, your, your career, you've, you've, um, you've had, like you said, a scavenger hunt for the ages in terms of some of the th experiences you've had and the things you've done. Thank you for sharing some of those thoughts. I do have one last question for you. And because I noticed on LinkedIn that you have a unique title and the title that you have in your profile isn't like this, you know, Sea level this or this or that. It is, I lead the department of why. So why? Like what's what's the story there? Why is the question. It was inspired, of course, by Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why, how great leaders inspire everyone to take action. And that resonated with me because one of my strengths, finder's strength, is activator. I'm always looking for ways to tap into individual motivations and asking why helps unlock that. But when I went to TA group, I was walking into an environment with these tough military guys who did not value marketing. And I immediately rebranded myself as the department of why. It was a department of one at that time, just to help explain what marketing could do. So why do we exist as a company? Why do employees come to work every day? Why do customers care what we have to offer? Why do partners want to work with us? Why do people refer us? Why do employees stay? Like all of those questions are things within the marketing realm. And I was trying to help them see the bigger picture of that. And as I grew my team, asking why was a way to empower them uh, so they could be consultative and not just order takers on, oh, I need one of those. Give me a deck. Give me a campaign. Uh, I really encourage them to go back and say, why are we doing this? What do we really want people to do? What do we want them to take away from it? And I think asking why a few more times uh, always makes me better and always makes the plan better. I think the, the why is a wonderful framing for a question if done with real intent to understand. Um, and I, because I, I think the power of a good question to draw out additional context, to add to that pool of understanding that, um, that's that's talked about. To, like though, that's where teams need to live. What a fun title! What <laughs> a fun it. title! Fun team. Yeah, yeah, that's a that sounds like a great department to lead. Come on Thank over. You. We're <laughs> yeah, we're perfect. I'll send it right over. Um, Cheryl, thank you for spending the time on the era. Really appreciate your insights. And I know I've learned a lot. Thank you so much for having me. This is fantastic. And I can't wait to listen to the rest of your episodes. Thank you, Cheryl. And this will, this will we'll wrap our episode here of the era. Thank you for all that, um, for tuning in. And as we explore different aspects of the employee experience and how we can, as leaders, continue to show up in a powerful way for those that we work with every day. Thank you and tune in next time.